Today, I'm going to tell you about tensor estimation with nearly linear samples given weak side information. This is joint work with Xu Mei Shi, who is a PhD student at Cornell. Think of a tensor as a generalization of a matrix in which a matrix is simply a two order tensor where each data point is indexed by two indices denoting the row and the column. Uh, in general, a t-order tensor you can visualize as a t-dimensional hypercube in which every data point is indexed by t indices. So we're going to be considering the task of tensor estimation or completion in which we are given a sparsely observed data tensor that could, be, uh, could also be noisy. And the question is, can we recover the underlying full tensor? Since this is impossible in full generality, typically we will assume low rank structure, which will reduce the degrees of freedom of the underlying tensor to only linear in N. So a natural question that results is, what is the minimum number of observations required for estimation? And um, we're gonna assume uh, the Bernoulli sampling model, which is also commonly assumed in the literature in which every entry is independently observed with probability P. So there's two common definition of tensor rank. Um, well, th there's actually a few more, but we're gonna focus on, on these two. The CP rank is the minimum number of rank one tensors in which the sum of these rank one tensors uh, equals the original tensor. The Tucker rank um, ar arises from uh, essentially a higher order singular value decomposition in which you write the tensor as a multilinear multiplication of latent factor matrices corresponding to each mode, as well as a core tensor. Um, the latent factors of these, uh, of these matrices um, are orthogonal, whereas in the CP rank decomposition, the latent factors of these rank one tensors may not be orthogonal. When the core tensor is super diagonal, these two definitions coincide and it implies that in fact, there is a, a, uh, um, a orthogonal way to write the tensor as a sum of rank one tensors in which all the latent factors are orthogonal and that comes directly from the Tucker rank decompositions as well. The majority of the talk, we're gonna focus on tensors in which there is such a orthogonal CP rank decomposition, which corresponds to a Tucker decomposition in which the, the core tensor is super diagonal, um, but our results do extend um, to be beyond this orthogonal CP rank setting. So let me um, sketch to you the, um, the current um, state of the art for statistical guarantees. Uh, the first set of techniques that were used were to simply unfold the tensor and use matrix estimation. Um, that's a natural thing to do. And uh, this achieves a sample complexity of n to the ceiling of t over two, where t is the mode of the tensor. Uh, and and is, each is the dimension of each mode. Uh, subsequently, there has been a, a, a follow-up work in, in using sum of squares, spectral methods, and iterative clever filtering to reduce the sample complexity uh, by accounting for the tensor structure, um, but still relying um, fundamentally on matrix methods. And these are able to achieve n to the t over two. So in particular, there's a gain when t may be odd. Um, there is a exponential time algorithm for tensor nuclear norm minimization, which achieves a sample, a, a sample complexity of n to the three over two for a general t order tensor. But again, this is not a polynomial time algorithm. And additionally, there is uh, the, the naive statistical lower bound is only linear in n as there's only linear in n uh, degrees of freedom in the low rank model. Um, I wanna point out that there is a conjecture computational statistical gap um, between the linear in n statistical lower bound and n to the three halves for um, three order tensors in particular. And this is based on a reduction from tensor estimation to random three XOR, uh, random three XOR dis uh, uh, distinguishability. In the setting where you have an active sampling scheme, you can achieve a linear sample complexity, but this does require um, that all of your samples kind of align along modes, which often is not the case when you have um, a data set that is you know, directly given to you. And so a key question that we want to ask in this talk is what minimal additional information or assumption could facilitate linear sample complexity under this uniform or Bernoulli sampling model? So let me give you a simple example to build some intuition on the uh, key concept of our algorithm. 
suppose we have a rank one tensor here. And what I, uh, I'm gonna do is just simply take this rank one tensor, I'm gonna average entries along the third mode. Now you can take a look that the, the average entries of the latent factor along the third mode is 1.6. And so if I um, average entries across the third mode of the tensor, I simply get 1.6 times the matrix corresponding to um, the, the latent factors of the first two modes. And so the nice thing is that now what this suggests is that um, I could average entries on the third mode and then in this simple matrix setting, um, I still have the same low rank structure with the same latent factors. And so I could uh, use linear observations to, um, to learn the latent factors of the matrix. And I would have the guarantee that these latent factors are shared with the latent factors of the tensor. Of course, I wanna point out right from the start here that this would not work if the sum of the latent factors is zero as when you average entries out in the other direction, you would in the third mode, you would just get zero times uh, you know, the matrix, which um, essentially you'd be averaging out and losing all your signal. So of course I kind of um, first introduced this idea in the setting where I, you know, we might have a, a full matrix, but in reality, a full tensor, but in reality, we actually observe each entry of the tensor with only probability P. So we actually have a sparse tensor. And so you can ask, well, if I average the observations along the third mode, now I'm not averaging all the entries because I'm all averaging only the observations that I actually sampled, which is gonna be significantly less. Uh, what I get is that um, on the right-hand side, um, the corresponding matrix will have a non-zero entry with probability P tilde, uh, where P tilde is equal to the probability that um, at least one of the entries along the third mode uh, is observed, which is going to be one minus one minus p to the here I have a, a five five a size five um, dimension, but um, in general it'd be one minus p to the n. Um, so you can think of uh, the the um, instead of now. Uh, Okay, so previously we had multiplied by a simple constant 1.6, but now we're actually doing is we're multiplying by some uh, random matrix W, where this random matrix W is going to be um, the average of the latent factors in the third mode that are actually sampled. So in particular here, you can see the, the entries of WAB um, is going to be, uh, if I fix, a and B in, as the coordinates of the first two modes of the tensor, and I, and I vary the, third, the, the coordinate of the third mode of the tensor I uh, along the third mode, which has five um, entries. I'm, I'm taking the average of the observed values, so omega here is my sample set, uh, of the value of the latent factor here. So UI here is the value of the uh, third latent factor. So this U vector is, again, this third latent factor. Uh, and so this expected value of the uh, entry in this random matrix W is 1.6 times P tilde. Um, but of course, when we actually analyze this, we would have to account for this type of noise model where the noise model is actually multiplicative. So I'm taking a low rank matrix which is uh, defined by the latent factors of my first two modes, and I'm multiplying it by a random quantity, which um, you know has mean 1.6 times p tilde. Um, and so there's an additional randomness from the sampling process here that is a little bit non-standard um, compared to the typical um, type of no additive noise model assumed in the matrix estimation literature. But the key point is that we're taking the tensor uh, tensor completion problem on the left and we're mapping it to a, a matrix completion problem on the right. So we can extend this idea to rank R mode T tensors. So general rank R and also general um, um, uh, general mode um, tensors. And the, the only thing is, again, the, the key idea is the same is that, uh, let's say I would fix two modes of the tensor and I would average out observations along all the other modes. And uh, that would allow me to map my rank R tensor to a rank R matrix where the latent factors of the matrix are actually match, actually match the latent factors of the tensor. 
Um, and, and, and as such, the so the row space and the column spaces match. And that means that if I can, if I can do estimation on this matrix and learn the row and column subspaces, then I can um, use those to estimate the latent space of my tensors. And once I know the latent space of my tensors, then the estimation problem is easy. So again, on the bottom, what I equation I've written here is that if I had a rank R tensor, and again, here we're limiting to the setting where I have, suppose I'm, uh, I have, I'm looking at a orthogonal CP rank. So it's a sum of rank one, uh, R rank one tensors in which we're gonna assume these uh, latent factors are in fact orthogonal. Um, then if that's the case, then the corresponding matrix on the right is going to be also rank R where the latent factors are going to be the same latent factors as a tensor, but we're gonna have a different um, uh, singular value lambda tilde, which is the, uh, the, the I guess the, uh, singular value from the tensor on the left multiplied by the average of the um, value of the latent factor along the third mode, because that's what we're averaging over. Of course, if, if we had a general uh, T tensor, a mode T tensor, then you would average along all, all of the T, um, the T minus two other modes. And so the key condition we would need is that this lambda tilde can't be too close to zero, right? And so if lambda tilde is too close to zero, this matrix is ill-conditioned and then would be very difficult to uh, recover from noisy samples. And so the key condition is going to be that we want the average of these latent factors along the other modes to not be too close to zero. So let me take a quick pause here and step back a moment. So the key idea was very simple. We took a tensor, we actually, instead of uh, unfolding it in the typical way that is often used, we instead are actually uh, kind of collapsing the tensor to a matrix, to a much smaller matrix. Um, and we uh, kind of, uh, like we, we argue that this kind of seem, seems reasonable under this condition that the average of latent factors can be cannot be too close to zero. However, um, you know, I haven't mentioned anything about side information yet, and that's something that I um, kind of promised in the beginning. So you can ask yourself, well, what happens if the average of the latent factors actually is close to zero? Well, you can think of uh, an extension of this idea to a setting with side information where you imagine the side information actually gives you a weight vector W. And now, so the, the side information is this weight vector W, and now the algorithm instead just weights the observation in all the other modes according to this weight vector W. Um, and, and you can again do the simple calculation and show that, that when you weight observations uh, along all other mo modes according to this um, weight vector W, the low rank tensor on the left will still um, uh, result in a low rank matrix on the right where this, um, the eigenvalues of the, or the, the singular values of the low rank matrix on the right hand side will be lambda tilde, where now lambda tilde is equal to lambda, the, the singular values of the tensor times the inner product between the weight vector W and the latent factor Q. And the key condition now becomes that I want this weight vector to be one such that the inner product between the weight vector and this, um, uh, and this latent factor Q has to be bounded away from zero. So again, um, the, the generalization to kind of summarize is that, you know, we don't have to take a simple average, we can take a weighted average. Um, and now I just need the side information to somehow tell me, uh, you know, this weighted average. And, and I guess if you want to think about this, what, what do I need from this weight vector W? I want that the inner product is bounded away from zero, meaning that somehow I need a vector, the side information should consist of a vector in which it can't be uh, completely orthogonal to any one of my latent factors that I need to recover, right? So this wave vector needs to be somehow in the, uh, I mean, somewhat in the interior of these like latent subspaces. That's not the formal definition for it. I mean, um, but but really you, you don't want your latent factor um, uh, to be orthogonal to any of these latent factors because any latent factor that's orthogonal to, once you um, weight the observations along the other mode and you kind of collapse the other mode, you end up um, kind of uh, losing that component of the signal. So let me summarize the kind of meta algorithm, which is given an observation tensor, 
and the weight vectors W, where you're given a weight vector for every mode of the tensor. We construct the matrix um, for a particular pair of modes. So think of Y and Z are a pair of modes. Um, uh, and the way you construct this matrix, again, is in the same way that we described earlier, where we simply collapse the, the tensor along all other modes by summing out. So here we're summing out along all the, um, so, sorry, so this matrix, the entry A, B of this matrix corresponds to summing out over all the entries that are observed uh, that are fixed, where, where you're fixing the um, coordinate uh, in mode Y to A and the coordinate at mode Z to B. Um, and, you're, and you're summing out the uh, observation itself times this product of these weight vector evaluated at that coordinate. And it's the product is over um, the, all the other modes. So if I have like a four mode tensor, then when I am summing out over all the other, uh, the other two modes for every um, entry, I multiply it by the weight vector corresponding to mode three and the entry in the weight vector corresponding to mode three and the entry in the weight vector corresponding to mode four. Um, and then we just, you know, uh, I guess we, we normalize it by the number of entries that you're summing over. Now, once you construct this matrix, you apply matrix estimation on the matrix to compute M hat and approximate the latent factors of the tensor from the latent factors of the M hat. And finally, given the estimated latent factors of the tensor, then uh, constructing the est estimate of the tensor is fairly straightforward. We have three variants of the algorithm. So unfortunately, I don't have too much time here to unfold them for you, but um, they're using very standard tools. So the first variant uses alternating least squares for the matrix estimation component, and then uses least squares minimization for the tensor estimation part, where again, we're, uh, the least squares minimization is easy now because we're given the latent factors that are estimated from the uh, matrix uh, estimation part of it. So we do alternating squares to construct a matrix, estimate the latent factors, take the latent factors and plug that into the tensor least squares minimization. Another variant uses um, a different approach for the matrix estimation part using iterative collaborative filtering on the matrix to compute distance matrices, which um, are estimating pairwise distances of coordinates in um, either the rows or the columns. Um, and it, it does this by taking the matrix, constructing a graph and comparing statistics computed over local neighborhoods. Again, this is also an existing method, you know, ha that has been introduced in matrix completion. And then given these distance matrices, you can compute a nearest neighbor averaging to compute the tensor. The third approach is to, again, use this iterative collaborative filtering to construct the distance matrices, but take the, uh, but factor the distance matrices to construct the latent factors and then corresponding plug these latent factors in to compute the least squares minimization for the tensor. So again, you can think again, there's this meta algorithm though, where you can plug in really any matrix estimation algorithm in the middle. We look at these three variants in our uh, experiments and our, our, um, our proof is going to be on variant two, uh, just simply um, because the analysis on the iterative collaborative filtering method um, is, is more uh, flexible to different types of noise distributions that only requires bounded noise. And so it allows us to deal with this type of multiplicative noise um, that arises from our the collapsing the tensor. So um, and the key assumptions we need on the sample uh, side information are of either two potential types. So first of all, the first type of condition is actually not a side information condition, but saying that if the sum of your latent factors are bounded away from zero, and incoherent so that the sampling is uh, kind of gives you nice concentration, then computing a simple average is sufficient and you don't even need any side information. Alternately, if you um, if it's if the latent factors are may not be bounded away from zero, the sum may not be bounded away from zero, then we will require that that there's side information given in the form of weight vectors, weight vectors one for each mode. Um, and we're going to construct matrix by uh, matrices from the tensor by weighting the observation across all modes according to these weight vectors. And the key constraint on this weight vectors, this side information that's provided is that the inner product between the weight vector and the latent factors has to be uh, bounded away from zero. So again, this is, allows us to show that the, if you have a low rank tensor, you get a low rank matrix with the same latent factors um, uh, where the, the singular values of the, um, of the corresponding matrix um, have to do with these inner products. And that's why we need these inner products to be bounded away from zero to make sure the matrix is well-conditioned. 
And we can extend this idea a little bit beyond orthogonal CP rank as well. Um, but again, you can imagine that the similar, the main thing is that we, the main property we need is that when you um, collapse the tensor into a matrix, that you preserve all components of the signals from the latent factor matrices and that the matrix corresponding matrix is not ill-conditioned. Uh, I wanna make a quick comment um, in relation to previous work in that previous work does assume knowledge of, uh, well, there's previous work in tensor estimation that um, try to look at side information and all of them either assume knowledge of the, the full latent subspaces, which is um, obviously very much more restrictive than our condition of needing a single weight vector. So, so these set of works assumes full knowledge of the latent subspace. Uh, and the second type of assumption is to, uh, a side information assumption is to assume that there's similarity or kernel matrices that are known for, again, every mode of the tensor. Both of these types of assumptions are way stronger than the type of uh, side information that we require. And furthermore, all of these um, uh, works and tensor estimation plus side information lacks st st statistical guarantees. So what we're able to show is that, um, you know, for a T order tensor, where we have um, a standard model in which we have uniform sampling, bounded entries, IID Gaussian observation noise, uh, a latent factor, uh, a latent variable um, model in which the latent factors are drawn from a population, population distribution, and there's a low rank latent function uh, along with Lipschitzness. Um, the Lipschitzness is used for the nearest neighbor, um, uh, the, the nearest neighbor step at the end. So under these assumptions, then given the side information such that this uh, condition is holds that the that the inner product between this weight vector and the latent factors is bound away from zero, then uh, for this um, sample probability p being at least this amount with high probability, our um, algorithm does give uh, maximum entry wise bounds that do converge to zero. Uh, maximize maximum entry-wise bounds on the error that converge to zero. And in particular, if you look at the threshold for the sample probability, um, it, it does in fact allow for the um, total number of observations to be nearly linear. So n to the one plus kappa, where kappa can be anything uh, you know, greater than zero. So indeed, this achieves our goal of getting linear sample complexity. Um, the last thing I want to comment is that we did run experiments um, and we benchmark our, our three variants of our algorithm against a few um, uh, existing state-of-the-art algorithms um, in the literature. And we benchmarked it on four different scenarios, a, synth a synthetic uh, a synthetic data, MRI data, traffic data, and a 3XOR, random 3XOR. Uh, in all of these experiments, we did not use any side information. So, uh, uh, but we just simply use a uniform weight vector and average, did the simple average uh, across uh, the other modes. And we evaluate the performance on the normalized mean squared error. So the first setting is a synthetic one in which we have Gaussian sampled latent factor matrices. Um, and our, our, um, our algorithms are the green one, the, the orange line and the blue line. And you can see that when the sampling probability is small, so in the very sparse setting, Indeed, our algorithms actually do better than the others. And the, the red line here is the naive average of all entries. So you can see at some low sampling probability, we do hit this threshold that um, none of these algorithms can do better than just a naive average. But again, our methods do better than the, the benchmark uh, existing works. Uh, the next data, data set is an MRI data set. And then you can see our algorithms, the green, blue, and orange also do well especially in the low sample, or oh, well, actually across this, um, the depicted range, but this is, uh, we kind of zoomed into a sparse sampling setting. The traffic data here is a little bit um, kind of uh, not as clear, but um, you can see that for low sampling probabilities, our algorithms indeed do well, um, particularly the least squares minimization algorithm, uh, the, the algorithms that um, use least squares minimization for the tensor estimates uh, does slightly better than the nearest neighbor, than the nearest neighbor variant. Finally, we also want to benchmark on something that should break our algorithm. So we did a three XOR. And so here, the latent vectors are sampled from Rademacher random variables. So in particular, if you average along the latent factor vector, you get zero. So as we expect, our algorithm completely doesn't do well. It does worse than uh, the naive average. But this is kind of 
a good check of our intuition that indeed the algorithm does break down when there is uh, such perfect amount of symmetry in this um, in this tensor. So because the latent factors are each coordinate is sample from a rata macro random variable, um, there's really no good way to construct a weight vector for this 3XOR data set, which supports the, the um, I guess, the conjecture that uh, random 3XOR is a difficult problem. All right, so in conclusion, we um, are able to show that we can recover tensor with linear samples if there's enough asymmetry in the tensor and if the mean of the latent factor is bounded away from zero. Um, or if that's not true, then it, we can also recover um, the tensor with nearly linear samples if we're instead given side information in the form of a weight vector that satisfies this weak condition that the inner product with the latent factor should be bounded away from zero. So the methods and analysis do follow very simply from um, matrix estimation as long as we can handle these general, general uh, multiplicative style noise, noise models. Um, and, uh, and empirically, it does seem that the side information may actually not be necessary since we um, you know, see from the real, real MRI and traffic data sets that taking the simple average along the other modes was sufficient. Um, all right, thanks. I'm happy to take questions. Um,